Well, any concerns of Cyberpunk 2077's release date being moved again has mostly been put to ease in the last week or so, with CDPR's CFO telling investors in a recent financial presentation that when we meet again in this format, Cyberpunk 2077 will have already been released. The next financial presentation or earnings report is scheduled for sometime around December. CDPR's joint CEO additionally followed up, adding that everything is on track and we're planning to launch it on November 19th. On social media, the official Cyberpunk 2077 accounts have also made pretty clear that things are moving smoothly ahead, and have even made some lighthearted jokes about recent delay concerns. Regardless, Cyberpunk 2077 is under 66 days away from release, and actually the one big competitor going head-to-head -head with CD Projekt Red's ambitious RPG was Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed Valhalla, originally set to launch two days before Cyberpunk 2077. And I, I say was because Ubisoft wisely in recent days moved that release date up a week, getting about nine days away from arguably this year's biggest game. Very likely a smart business decision, as most definitely Cyberpunk will dominate the worldwide spotlight for some time once it arrives November 19th with mostly everything else getting drowned out. Now, as we count down the days to Cyberpunk 2077's release, we also await the next reveal, which is set just a few days from now, and that is Night City Wire Episode 3. As I have done with all previous episodes, I will of course be live streaming this event, so make sure to join the channel on September 18th, a few minutes before 12 o'clock or noon Eastern Standard Time. Now. What do we know about this reveal thus far? Well, CD Projekt Red has already released a teaser which shows character models from within the game of each gang, and it really is impressive the design and style of each of them. We'll talk more about the teaser in a moment or two, but gangs and likely some gameplay of each of them will be featured in Night City Wire Episode 3, giving us a better understanding of who they are. Besides that, CD Projekt Red has also revealed that we'll be getting a tour of Night City, likely some gameplay again, maybe from each district, and further insight into the creation of the original score and the radio stations that will be present in the game. Now, for those wondering if Episode 3 is the final episode of this in-depth series from CDPR, it is not. CDPR's global community lead, Marcin Mamat, has said that they have plans for more. Anyway, today though, we have a mountain full of new details to discuss. This includes new gameplay and images, new interviews, new previews, tons of recent news, story and character teases, open world features, Features and much more. But as usual, before we proceed forward, if you go in to enjoy this content and want to show your support for videos like this, please consider hitting that like button, subscribing for more, and turning notifications on so you do not miss out on any new content. Also, if you want to further support content like this, I'm on Patreon. Backing the channel also gets you some perks or benefits like being featured in the credits of this video. As always, links are down in the description below. Nonetheless, as I mentioned at the start of the video, things are indeed roaring ahead. At CD Projekt Red's Polish headquarters, they even recently put up a big old Cyberpunk 2077 poster with that November 19th release date. As CDPR's lead PR manager, Radek Grabowski, stated, same spot, different year. Now, if you're at all curious about the marketing campaign for Cyberpunk 2077, it appears things are only starting to ramp up, and I say that because of this slide that was shown to investors during CDPR's most recent financial presentation. And what it shows is that that while the focus has been on digital up to this point in time, that will begin to expand next month with more TV, print, radio, and cinema advertising. Then in November, out-of-home advertising will begin, and if you're unaware of what that means, think back to Red Dead Redemption 2, or really any highly anticipated game, in which worldwide there were billboards, benches, and bus stops hyping up the game's release. So maybe Cyberpunk 2077 makes an appearance in, say, Times Square, New York. But one of the bigger marketing partnerships went live recently. Maybe you've already noticed this at your local gas station or convenience store, but Rockstar Energy Drinks and CDPR have teamed up with Samurai Cola. This partnership entails consumers gaining codes for digital comics and exclusive gear. Nothing in the actual game because CDPR has been firm on everyone getting the same experience for $60. Now, back to this financial presentation, a lot more actually was revealed, like comparing the hype of The Witcher 3. Three Wild Hunt versus Cyberpunk 2077, it's just not even close. And it really reflects how CDPR's reputation has seen a significant boost following arguably the game of this current console generation. 
This may or may not be surprising, but so far CDPR has spent $121 million developing Cyberpunk 2077. This includes the standalone multiplayer game coming likely in 2022. Cyberpunk 2077 is nearing the final legs of its development, as Adam Kaczynski told investors that, So yes, we are confirming, and well, actually, today we started preparing for the final certification. So we're very close. Of course, we'll work on the title till the very end. That's kind of normal. It's a huge game, but as we said, everything is on track. And again, that's coming from Adam Kaczynski, the CEO or the joint CEO and president of CD Projekt Red. Now, CDPR also confirmed that next-gen versions of Cyberpunk 2077 will be developed internally and would not cost $70 like some greedy AAA game publishers have chosen to do so. VP of Business Development Mikhail Novakowski saying, as I mentioned when answering the previous question, we already announced a while ago pre-orders for our game in the US going at $59.99 and we're not planning to change that price at the last minute. This should be encouraging to those wondering about post-launch plans for Cyberpunk 2077, but joint CEO Adam Kaczynski reiterated that Cyberpunk would follow a similar DLC plan to that of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, specifically saying that yes, you can expect a similar path to The Witcher 3 after release. You can expect more, actually. We're not going into too many details today. As we are close to the release, expect the post-release plans to be revealed fairly soon. A series of free DLCs and expansions will be described. As I said, you can expect it fairly soon, and then everything will be made clear. The notable part about this quote, which has gotten some attention, is the emphasis on the word more. As noted by gaming outlet VGC, The Witcher 3 released with an extensive DLC calendar, which saw two pieces of free DLC drop every week for two months following the game's release. DLC packs include included five new quests, new weapons, and armor sets, cosmetics, and a new game plus mode. Then of course there was the two big paid story driven expansions. So Cyberpunk 2077, based on what CDPR is saying right now, expect more than that. Also, if it wasn't already clear, free DLC is once again coming with Cyberpunk 2077. This was confirmed a while ago, but again mentioned recently on social media by CDPR, and now during this earnings report. Interestingly though, something else that came from this financial presentation are some developers playtesting the game. In this first screenshot, and yes I know it's a bit blurry, but we can see multiple individuals likely playtesting the character creation menu, which looks to have gotten a facelift since the last time we saw it. In the next two images we can see what appears to be CD Projekt Red developers playing around with the game. One developer being present in both images is senior level designer Miles Tost, and even though again those images are blurry, the gameplay on the screen just makes me even more excited. as in the image on the screen, you can really get a sense of the scale of the world. Now, it's probably important we next tackle one of the most controversial pieces of information that came from this financial presentation, and that was on the multiplayer. CDPR's president and joint CEO Adam Kaczynski revealed that Cyberpunk multiplayer will incorporate some form of microtransactions. Kaczynski promised, though, that, well, we're never aggressive towards our fans. We treat them fairly and we're friendly, so of course not. We won't be aggressive, but you can expect great things to be bought. The goal is to design monetization in a way that makes people happy to spend money. I'm not trying to be cynical or hide something, it's about creating a feeling of value. Kaczynski's comments continued, Same as with our single player games, we want gamers to be happy while spending money on our products. The same is true for microtransactions. You can expect them, of course, and Cyberpunk 2077 is a great setting for selling things, but it won't be aggressive, it won't upset gamers, but it'll make them happy. That's our goal at least. No matter what, CDPR messing around with any form of online online monetization is going to get the ire of some gamers, and I actually understand concerns. I've heard the comparisons made to Rockstar Games and what happened to them when they went big with an online component, example being Grand Theft Auto Online, but my god is there a lot of assumptions and misinformation out there. I've seen many accusing CDPR of hypocrisy by saying they leave greed to others, but now they do this. The thing is, nothing has changed. Cyberpunk's multiplayer is a standalone separate game that we know nothing about. This is something I sometimes Sometimes do, but it's not Cyberpunk 2077 directly connected. It's developed by a separate team and is not coming for a few years. It's very well maybe even free to play, that we just don't know. I guess right now, what I'm doing is reserving judgment until something is actually shown. I think many forget that CDPR has an online microtransaction driven game, and that's Gwent. As far as I understand, there's been no drama with that title because there's nothing wrong with it, nothing controversial. Regardless, as this drama exploded on 
social media with some gaming outlets like GameSpot weirdly blowing this out of proportions. CDPR did officially respond pointing out, nothing changed. Cyberpunk 2077 is a single player game with zero microtransactions. One single purchase, no tricks, don't believe the clickbait. Cyberpunk multiplayer slash online, which is a separate project, will have some microtransactions, but we said that a year ago already. Like always, expect us treating your money with respect. Now, moving past this financial report and some other news, CDPR has provided us with new looks at Cyberpunk 2077. Celebrating 1 million Twitter followers, the official Cyberpunk account published new artwork of Mail V standing beside his Quadra Turbo R vehicle, taking in the view of Night City. And a new gameplay screenshot, we have a Thornton modified three-door hatchback driving through the Badlands, attempting to escape from Arasaka forces. We've seen this scene a few times in recent gameplay footage in which this comes from the Nomad Life Path, which has Jackie driving the car and V fights back by shooting at Arasaka vehicles. Now the next screenshot titled Print is Not Dead, we get a look at one of the newspaper stands of Night City in which a man with what appears to be cheaper cyberware walks by with a cigarette in his hand. On the actual newspaper stand, you can see different types of magazines with one having the deceased founder of the city, Richard Knight, on the cover. Another titled Blazing Fast shows off a luxury white sports car. Other than that, we see different bottles of cola, an advert for pop it in your mouth, which might be some sort of drug, and then a newspaper headline mentioning bloody protests happening in Night City, which might be some actual chaos and destruction that we contribute to. Now, something that I actually skimmed over earlier that I briefly want to return to is the gangs of Night City being teased, and within this short footage, we get a look at the design of gang members from each gang. First, we have the more aggressive and bulked up animals, featuring some heavy weaponry and boxing gloves. The less ruthless nomads, the Aldecados, who sport the not-so-reliable budget arms carnage shotgun and some melee weaponry. Then there's the Maelstrom gang, decked out in visible high-tech cyberware with a glowing red theme soaking in the background. The mocks feature skimpy outfits but are all about business, with handguns holstered and bats ready to be put to use. The Sixth Street gang have their very own unique patriotic theme with a bald eagle filling in the background, and I suppose a more futuristic approach to an American militia force with weapons holstered all over their bodies. The Tiger Claws employ methods of Asian crime syndicates with a very unique aesthetic and weaponry that includes a katana and an SMG. The Valentinos are influenced by their Latin traditions with roses and gold dominating their design. The Voodoo Boys, a group of dangerous net and edge runners that look like they came straight from the Matrix, and lastly the Wraith Gang, the more dangerous nomads appear to be all about death and destruction. Since the last Night City Wire episode, our most significant reveal came during NVIDIA's GeForce RTX 30 series reveal event, in which I now need to upgrade for my 2070 Super, but Cyberpunk 2077 did make a very brief appearance, which isn't at all that surprising considering the partnership that CDPR has with NVIDIA, and also they kind of teased it ahead of time. What we got was 30-ish seconds of new gameplay footage with an emphasis, of course, being on the graphics, as Cyberpunk 2077 was used to highlight the new 30 series at max settings in 4K with ray tracing and DLSS enabled, we get a look at the beauty of Night City. Much of the footage is indeed self-explanatory, but it starts off with an overlook of the city at night, with many of the advertisements on buildings lighting up the city. And the next shot, and this is actually really cool, but this is a nighttime view of the infamous daytime shot of the Watson District shown during the 48-minute E3 2018 gameplay footage. And obviously the difference between these two shots of the same location is the amount of NPCs, and that's of course because the time of day. But also, there seems to be way more advertisements in the background. Moving ahead with this footage, CDPR is again very, very careful with what's being shown because all of the next shots mostly come from scenes that we've already seen before, like the El Coyote Coho Bar, in which some Valentino's gang members hang around, the outside and inside of the Afterlife Bar, the lively headquarters for the Mox Gang, which is Lizzie's Bar, and a few other scenes from the Life Path gameplay that was released in late June. Fortunately, we do get some new stuff like some action-packed gameplay with V again using the budget arms blunderbuss to blast enemies away, then a machine gun spraying bullets at I believe Maelstrom gang members as we can see some environmental destruction as cement blows into pieces as we shoot through it. Then again, on a rooftop with a blunderbuss shotgun, we engage with Tiger Claw gang members who are staking at a location. And another scene we've seen before using I believe the Constitutional Defender, V engages in a boss fight with Maelstrom leader Royce. Again, another scene from the 2018 E3 gameplay demo, but as V fires away, it looks like at least on this heavy weaponry, we're close to 
overheating the weapon. In the next few shots, we see an emphasis on various environments of Night City, like once again the El Coyote Coho Bar, Lizzie's Bar, and the Afterlife Bar, as well as the inside of a parking garage, Misty's Esoterica, and an abandoned warehouse. Probably my favorite shots are that of an overview of a roundabout, service robots that have Corporation Kang Tao labeled on them as they guard an armored Chevalon truck, the front view showing the inside of V's Quadra Turbo R as he drives on a highway, and then either an NCPD or security officer firing their SMG into a target taking cover in a dumpy underpass. Then the final two shots are that of V engaging with Arasaka forces in the Nomad life path, and again another scene from the E3 2018 gameplay demo, this time at night in which V fights off a scavenger van which eventually crashes. Next, one of the bigger story or character teases came the other day when CDPR's global community lead Marcin Mamat shared this image of himself preparing for some cyberpunk related filming, unrelated to Night City Wire though. What drew attention specifically from this image was the shirt that he was wearing, and eventually it was found to be official Cyberpunk 2077 merchandise, only available supposedly in Poland. And notably the text on his shirt states the following, Oda is the blank, Cyber Ninja and Hanako Arasaka's blank, devoted bodyguard, everything he knows, blanks, martial arts, blank, from Takumura, blank, his sensei and close friend, appearance we sought, blank, from traditional ninja tropes, blank, of the cyberized future. Now, of course, some of this text is cut off, which is why I kept saying blank, but Mamat would tease at the contents of this shirt on Twitter, and really the big takeaways is this mysterious cyber ninja bodyguard Oda, which I certainly can envision a big boss battle, but also, again, the connection to this mysterious character Takamura, which we've seen multiple times in physical products, but so far, CDPR has been mostly silent on his role. All we can assume is that Takamura will have a prominent role in the narrative of Cyberpunk 2077. We also also finally get our first mention to another member of the Arasaka family, that being Hanako, the youngest child of Saburo Arasaka. She should be about 78 years old during the events of Cyberpunk 2077. It's said that she's still in charge of a portion of her family's company in 2077, and some speculation has been made that we've already actually seen her before in one of the recent trailers, or well, the backside of her as she overlooks the city. Either way, it definitely seems like the Arasaka family will play a significant role in the event that transpire throughout the storyline of Cyberpunk 2077. Moving along, we now have a new preview of Cyberpunk 2077 to break down, and that comes via the official PlayStation magazine in the UK. The first big detail shared comes from one of the game's art directors, who reveals that there are 29 base models of cars in the game, which can be found in countless varieties, including Nomad sets. He further elaborates by revealing that different types of a base car will not just be simple reskins. Instead, they will change the way vehicles behave and offer additional protection to drivers. An example given was with the Nomad version of the Quadra Reaver, in which Nomads install an anti-mine detector systems mod on their vehicles, which can help detect mines in the wastelands. Didn't know that was something that we would have to be concerned about, but now we know. It appears each faction will have vehicles that offer their own unique mods or differences than the base models and the other versions. This, of course, also may not be limited to just factions, but as quest rewards and or simple eddies to purchase a unique vehicle vehicle that suits our taste. Even more cool is that you actually will not need windows in 2077 to drive a vehicle. What that means is that utilizing crystal dome technology, players are able to view the outside through a screen that wraps around you. The CDPR art director specifically explained that how this works is that basically an LCD screen with armor outside. So when you get into the car, you shut the door, it's completely dark in there, and after a minute the lights light up. There's this cool effect of disappearing meshes and seeing, looking like through the the LCD screen so there are noises, there are glitches happening on the screen. They also don't have windows because their owners care about their protection, right? So they just don't want everybody to see them and they want to be, it's like a sporty armored tank basically. Car tanks. That actually sounds pretty cool, it reminds me of the Dark Knight trilogy, but within this new preview we did get a look at two different versions of the Quadra Type 66. We have the standard yellow edition and then in a dark green which has been heavily customized with no windows and some sort of cosmetic design 
design of a mammal with its skeleton only being shown being on both the driver and passenger side doors, it's it's unique. It certainly is. Definitely a Nomad or Badlands enhanced version, and we've actually seen both versions of this vehicle in recent Cyberpunk 2077 gameplay footage. Now lastly, with vehicles, it was mentioned that we'll have the ability to steal or obtain factory, sporty, and junk set versions of vehicles. Specifically with junk sets, that term was made by CDPR and represents aged retrofitted cars with tech like solar panels. Some of the other unique features that we'll find on non-base versions of a car includes bigger tires and different windshields that affect how they are able to handle. Other than just cars, we also got some new details in the weapons of Cyberpunk 2077, with CDPR's Ben Andrews, concept art coordinator, first discussing the weapon culture in Night City, saying, One of the things that we thought about with weapons is that in Cyberpunk, we have a very overt weapon culture. It's very different to the way weapons work in our world. This is like American gun culture just gone crazy, you know. Everybody has a gun because violence has been taken to the extremes. The idea that you may be mugged on your way home from work is extremely common, or your apartment might be broken into at the weekend, so everybody's carrying a gun. And when he says everyone, he means everyone, as we saw with a budget arms family advertisement which showed the kids locked and loaded up. Andrews would next reveal a new weapon. We have a gun called the Budget Arms Slotomatic, and it's one of the coolest guns we have. It's basically just a really crappy gun. It's bright pink, while it comes in every color imaginable, it's disposable, and it cannot be reloaded. Once you buy the gun, you empty the clip, you cannot reload it. You just throw it away and you buy a new one, because it costs almost nothing. Andrews would continue explaining the thought process behind this, pointing out that you can purchase a gun like this at one of the 24-7 stores, or a vending machine for like five eddies. Use it during the weekend to defend yourself, then throw it away and buy another. Andrews would further discuss some of the high-tech weaponry at our disposal, like that of Arsaka's guns, which again, we have another screenshot showing the design of some of these weapons. Andrews mentions that one of the weapons is an Arasaka smart gun, which does not utilize traditional ammunition, but that of mini-guided explosive rockets that allow you to lock onto targets, ensuring that all bullets hit the target. Andrews also goes into detail on Borg weapons, gun Guns made for highly cybernetically enhanced users, and he explains that if you're underclassed or not leveled up enough, and using one of these powerful guns, it will actually throw you onto the floor when you fire them. Definitely sounds like a very neat feature. Now, the final thing that I do want to show from this preview is another high detailed look at the character model of Johnny Silverhand. This is the digital ghost that we will be spending a lot of time with. Moving along next, we have a recent Russian Q&A that was conducted by CDPR's senior quest designer Philip Weber. Fortunately, all of his answers were given in English, and I thought we'd briefly touch on some of the highlights from this 21-minute Q&A video. So first, Weber responds to a question about the different partners like Jackie that we can team up with, and he teases at some of the romancing that we may have going on with some of these partners. Uh, there actually are quite a few people that you can, you know, play different quests with that are very important to the story and that also come with you on specific missions or, you know, just for having a drink on a drive. And, you know, like Jackie, they will be very important. And there's actually lots of them and quite important ones that we haven't shown yet at all. So I'm really looking forward to people meeting these characters and finding out what they're all about. And, you know, some of these characters, depending on your choices, you might like and they might like you and some of those characters might become your foes or your enemies so it's of course you know we're making a role-playing game so it's all up to you and sometimes you might make a friend or a lover and sometimes you can make an enemy but it's really important for us that we have these uh, you know important characters that can be with you in your story and wherever it makes sense for them to be. And the next question, we have one user asking about the different types of weather that we might encounter, and Weber again teases the dangers of the Badlands. So as like in The Witcher, it's very important for us to really give you this dynamic world. So that of course means there is a dynamic day and night cycle, but also dynamic ways in the way the weather can change. So sometimes you might have nice sunshine, sometimes it rains or is foggy, or, you know, there might be some big storms out in the Badlands. And of course, sometimes through, you know, the environment not being that nice in the future of 2077, there can also be acid rain. Now, on the question of utility vehicles, Weber would tease some likely story-connected content connected to an AI taxi company that's in the game. There's some utility vehicles like that. So as an example, there might be AVs that are there to just transport big uh, freight containers. But there's also taxis. As an example, without spoiling too much, there's an AI taxi company called Delamain, 
and you might have some adventures with that domain, but I don't want to tell you yet how those look like. So the final question, Weber has asked about the different types of quests that we'll take part in, and whether or not we'll have some horror or mystical themed missions. Of course I don't want to spoil specific missions for you, but the thing is, if you read, you know, lots of different cyberpunk books, or watch movies, or play games, you can see that within the cyberpunk genre, there are many different stories that you can tell, and of course, you know, some more philosophical stories have a place there, or, you know, maybe something that's more like horror, or of course, you know, also straightforward action. And it was really important for us to really, you know, tell those different stories, because for us as developers, that's the most important thing. That's the most interesting thing for us to do. When we really come up with, you know, quests, we think, so what is a quest that, why is this quest special? Why does this quest need to be in the game? And often, one reason is that this is just a very important and interesting topic that we want to work with and we, that we want to show players. And of course, that can also mean that there's some more, let's say, you know, mystical topics. But at the end of the day, cyberpunk isn't a fantasy game. So it will still be, you know, rooted in the cyberpunk science fiction world. Now to the final part of this video, we're going to do a rundown on a ton of more Cyberpunk 2077 news and information, like the first person to earn the Platinum PlayStation 4 trophy for the game happened actually today. This being revealed in a screenshot by CDPR's Quality Assurance lead, we actually can see from this screenshot there are 45 trophies in total, with 1 Platinum, 1 Gold, 17 Silver, and 26 Bronze. This isn't too far off with what we saw with the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt's base game, which had, I believe, I believe it was 53 total trophies. CD Projekt Red has been working hard on localizing Cyberpunk 2077. It's been revealed that in the Mandarin Chinese dubbing, more than 150 voice actors have been used, 100,000 lines recorded, 4 recording studios, plus 10,000 person hours worked on this. It's said that the voice acting work is 15-20% to 20 more than The Witcher 3, including its DLC. Following the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 30 series event, there was some confusion over a slide which which imply that Cyberpunk 2077 could be 200 gigabytes in size. That confusion has since been clarified with CDPR's global community lead, Marcin Mamat, responding by saying that the game won't take up 200 gigabytes when installed. You can expect the required HDD space to be on par with other modern titles. It was also mentioned in this post that system requirements are coming very, very soon. Cyberpunk 2077 was a big winner at Gamescom, taking away most of the big awards, like Best RPG, which again led to confusion with some wondering how an unreleased game wins awards like this. CDPR's social media account responded by pointing out that to be fair, some of the jury members work for the German Age Rating Board. While we don't know what they have voted for, we do know that they have played a content complete version of Cyberpunk 2077 a lot. Celebrating 1 million YouTube subscribers, CDPR released a new full soundtrack from the game, which was featured, I believe, in the Last Night City Wire episode. The song is called Hole in the Sun by the in-universe band Point Break Candy, real-life artist Rainy Shockney, featuring Cause and Conway. Personally, I actually think that this song slaps hard, and it really does get the adrenaline going, so a nice tease at what the musical soundtrack will sound like, but also remember, there's a wide array, a variety of different types of music that will be in the game. Now, after the release of a few in-game screenshots with showcased small subtitles, CDPR has revealed that you will be able to adjust the color and size of dialogue options. A huge congrats to cyberpunk creator Mike Pondsmith, who was awarded the Jerry Lawson Lifetime Achievement Award from the Black and Gaming Awards, which took place during PAX Online. The Cyberpunk 2077 Trauma Team comic series has been released with its first issue, available in stores now, which follows Nadia, an assistant EMT in the Soul survivor of a failed rescue mission termed Shootout. In the latest merchandise partnership, CDPR has teamed up with Danilo, and you can now purchase your very own Cyberpunk 2077 themed calendar. German players can celebrate because it was announced by CDPR's lead release manager that the country's game rating board determined that Cyberpunk 2077 will not need to be altered, meaning that players will get access to the full version of the game come launch day. Last but not least, CDPR revealed artwork of Lizzy Wizzy voice 
voiced by Grimes, who appears on the latest issue of Cyber Magazine. But in the next coming days, we will have much more new Cyberpunk 2077 gameplay and details to discuss and break down with Night City Wire Episode 3. Right now, I'm planning out some extra lengthy Cyberpunk 2077 content, so look out for all of that in the near future. But definitely, things are moving right ahead fast with so much news being shared almost daily. Anyway, let me know your thoughts on everything that we did discuss today down in the comment section below. But thank you for watching. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video or if you found any informative value. And make sure to follow my other social media accounts for updates on new videos. Links are always down in the description below. I'm most active on Twitter giving opinions on news that I do not always get into video form, so do make sure to follow me over there. Also check out my Discord for all sorts of discussion on games. And again, thank you for joining. Consider subscribing for more videos like this, and I'll see you later.